All right, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, the Floor by Eight Loco Flow Mashup All About Roses. Uh, I am Ellen Frost. I'm the owner of Local Color Flowers. For those of you who are new to learning about Loco Flow, we are a floral design studio located in Baltimore, Maryland. We've been in business for 15 years and we source all of our flowers locally. So everything we use come from farms within 100 miles of Baltimore. I'm also an online educator with the Gardener's Workshop. I teach two classes there. Um, I'm a speaker, a mentor, a writer of a great weekly newsletter, if you are interested in checking that out. And I'm also a rose convert. Maybe some of you here are rose converts, or maybe you're on the fence and you're not sure, but I think after tonight, you will definitely be a rose convert. So before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Um, please keep yourself muted while we go. Um, Lauren and I are going to tag team on this presentation. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the chat. I will monitor them while Lauren's talking, and she can check them while I'm talking. And if something comes up that um, we don't want to wait, we'll ask the question then. Or if not, we'll just wait till um, the end and take questions then. Um, all right, I want to just say before we get started, um, I say that I'm a rose convert. Uh, I've been in business for 15 years, and I really did not believe that probably for the first 10 years in business that we would ever see local roses here in Baltimore. Um, I said these words, I'm not kidding, I told Lauren probably a thousand times. Roses are not available locally, they're not grown in this region. I said that to customers, to wedding customers, everybody I told we didn't have roses. And that was until I met Lauren about five years ago. Um, she came to us with just a handful of roses. Um, and I had not really ever even seen garden roses. I'm not going to lie because we are so hyper local here that I just had not really had any experience with this type of rose. And uh, they just blew me away. They are um, Nothing like commodity roses. Lauren's going to tell you all about why they're so special. Um, seeing them and using them over the last five years, um, I have really just become a huge fan of local roses and uh, try to use them as much as we can. So uh, I hope that you find them as exciting as I do. So I am going to let Lauren introduce herself and we're going to get started. Thanks, Ellen. Um, that always uh, makes me so excited to say that you no longer have to say that you don't get roses locally. Nope. I'm not ah. saying it anymore. Now I actually say local roses are available in the spring and the fall. I give them the times. I let them know all about it. So yes, a new a new uh, mantra now. Yes. Um, so my name's Lauren. Um, my farm or um, flower farm business is called Floor by Eight. It started as a four by eight square in my Baltimore City um, backyard. Um, I'm actually a full-time architect. So Floor by Eight grew out of something very architectural um, in the beginning. And I grow cut roses, solely cut roses um, as my part-time business. Um, I call it my five to nine because it's either a.m. or p.m. depending on the day. Usually it's a.m. in the summer. Um, and my um, farm is actually um, only about 1,200 square feet. And I have about, um, at this point, I think I'm looking at 160 rose plants from that 1,200 square feet and adding um, a bunch more in the spring. So I decided in about, what, two years ago to solely focus on growing roses. I was growing other flowers at that point too, but experimenting with roses and I haven't looked back. I want to just say that when we we did our peony talk a couple of weeks ago, one of the things that came up that Karen um, from Midsummer Farm really focused on was having um, peonies be sort of a specialization, you know, really focusing on peonies as the one sort of niche product that you grow. And I feel like roses can be a product like that as well. Like you said, yeah. you sort of stopped growing other things so that you can focus on roses. And I think for a lot of people, roses could just be like the side gig that they do. Right. And that 
works for me because flower farming is a part-time operation for me. Um, the amount of time and focus that I can spend cultivating any kind of flower was best spent on roses because no one else was growing them either. So it was for me a completely untapped market. Yeah. Um, I think that if you want to focus on roses as a part-time business, that completely works. You could probably make it a full-time business if you wanted to. Um, it's challenging in our region to do that. Um, but there's also a lot of opportunity for existing flower farms to add it to their crop rotation and capitalize on the seasonal availability that roses provide over the course of the spring and the fall when other flowers are kind of waning. Excellent. Um, so a few key things today, we're gonna go through the basics of growing roses, um, some variety and sourcing tips, harvest, post-harvest care. Ellen and I are gonna tag team marketing to florists because I think that we both ended up marketing to each other <laughs> when we started this journey. Um, and then Ellen will end with some tips and tricks for design and her perspective kind of sprinkled in throughout um, as a florist. Um, for the first two or three years that I grew roses, all of my roses went to Ellen and the local color flowers team. Um, so they, we've had a lot of experience working together and formed a nice um, working relationship over the past few years. So um, I'm jumping to make sure I'm not missing any questions. Cool. Um, so uh, not to oversimplify it, but the basics of growing roses are pretty simple. You just dig a hole, plant your plant, and then water it well. Um, this is as simple as it gets with all plants and as simple as it gets with roses too. Um, my favorite expression from um, a famous rosarian, Paul Zimmerman, is that roses are plants too. There's a lot of mystique and mythology and... Um, myths around cultivating roses and especially cultivating roses in regions where they're not traditionally grown for cut flowers. Um, but in the end, roses, they are plants too. If you can grow a peony, grow a tulip, grow a zinnia, you can also grow roses. So have confidence. Yes. And I will say too, it is very easy when you plant your first rose especially growing in a region that is not known for its rose cultivation in commercial cut flowers um, to feel like you might fail and to every day look at your plant and be worried about how it's performing. I have killed so many roses over the course of the last five years that I have grown them. It's, it might be me and it might just be the plant, but I think the best way to grow and to learn is to like literally get your hands on experience growing um and my little plug when I say not commonly cultivated as cut flowers in our region is that there are some pretty famous rose gardens in our region in the Baltimore um <clears throat> and Maryland DC Virginia area I mean the White House has a rose garden the Smithsonian has a rose garden like there are cultivated roses in the horticultural and um, botanical world all along the East Coast. It's just not a cut crop. Um, the best advice I can give anyone starting looking to start out is to just fall in love with a variety. If you like it, you're gonna take more care of it. So fall in love with what, something and plant that one. Um, roses commonly come in two different varieties when you order them. They're either bare root or potted. If you've ordered other perennial crops, you might have experienced this as well. Peonies typically come as a bare root. A lot of woody shrubs come potted. Um, <clears throat> bare roots are only available in the spring, typically, in our region. You don't want to plant them after May. It's a little bit too hot. They won't take to the ground very well. Whereas potted roses, you can plant anytime during the growing season from a little bit before the first frost to the last or from last frost to first frost. The big thing to know when you're sourcing plants is whether you're getting own root versus grafted. Um, a grafted plant has a separate variety as the rootstock as it does as the cultivated plant at the top. Um, I tend to prefer own root plants if possible. So own root is the 
there's no difference between the actual root stock and the top part of the plant itself. Um, you don't have to worry about any joint like graft failure with that regard. You don't have to worry about suckers or anything like that if you can source on root roses. Um, grafted plants will tend to perform a little bit better in their first few seasons. They might get you to a, a fuller um, cut crop faster, but they are a little bit more upkeep, especially in areas that have cold weather. Um, so for example, I had a few, we had that freak cold snap like last December, and I had a few top parts of my plants like down to the graft die, and I just dug them up this spring because I knew they weren't coming back. The top part of the plant died back to the bud union, and only the rootstock was left. So in the spring, if it tried to send out any new growth, I knew it would have been the, the rootstock variety, which I didn't want. Um, it's commonly called Dr. Huey, the rootstock in the United States. And you'll see um, this flower in the center of the slide kind of everywhere throughout any kind of um, neighborhood in the United States, basically anything that has roses planted in it because rootstock commonly um, will take over. Wait, so I, I mean, I have a question. Yes. So are you saying that the root, most of the rootstock is this one type of flower? Yes. So Dr. Huey is about, I think, 80% of rose rootstock grown in the United wow. States. Yep. It is good, strong roots, good, strong uh -huh. stock. Yep. And they do that because the other varieties do not have good, strong rootstock. Is that correct? So correct, depending upon the variety. So some okay. varieties, for example, Jubilee Celebration, which is one that I grow, it's a David Austin, it just will not perform on its own roots. It does not do well. You can only find the plant as a grafted plant. And if you see it sold online as own roots, don't buy it. It will not do well. Hmm. Um, some new introductions, for example, roses that are new will commonly be sold as grafted plants because they have the um, supplier hasn't had the time to grow an own root plant. So the grafted plants, they can typically get to market a little bit faster. Um, so they'll do that for the new introductions. Um, the plants also tend to grow a little bit bigger as they develop. Um, but over time, once you get to about year three or four, you're not going to see a difference between a grafted rose and an own root rose. Um, I am just self-proclaimed a lazy gardener and I would rather not have to worry about rootstock and suckers. If I see a new rose cane shooting up from the ground, I want to know that it is a healthy sign of a new cane forming from my rose and not worry about um, what's commonly called a sucker, which would be when the rootstock sends out its own cane, which you don't want it to do. Cool. Interesting. Yes. Dr. Huey. Dr. Huey, I yep. got him down. I feel like that could be a Jeopardy question. It, you know what? It might be, and you'll know it. And it's so. And uh, one actually quick tip with how to tell if you have um, a sucker and it's close to the bud unit and you're not sure. I typically like to wait that for that cane to grow and bloom. Dr. Huey is a once blooming red rose in the spring. So if you have a like what you suspect is a sucker growing and it does not bloom for a month or two, it's probably a sucker because Dr. Huey's once blooming. Great. Whoop. Um, potted roses, you can get an own root or grafted as well. Typically they do come own root though, um, just because they're grown in pots that they're going to be shipped in. Sizes can vary dramatically. A lot of reputable um, resources for potted roses will sell one gallon or two gallon potted plants. You can order much smaller plants called bands from other retailers as well. They'll just be probably like this tall. They come in something that's smaller than a quart. Um, very, very petite. And you can usually, you can plant these spring through fall. You can plant them in the summer as well, just water well. The biggest thing is to know what you're buying um, before you purchase. Roses do like sun, full or part sun. We have um, in our area of Baltimore, some mature trees that are blessed that with the orientation of the trees and the orientation of the sun, 
um, the area where my roses are does get full sun for the most part. Um, and we have what is <laughs> Baltimore is famous for here, which is some very dense clay soil. So roses can tolerate um, a lot of soil types, whether you have sandy, loam, clay. Um, I honestly don't know what the other type is. I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> <laughs> um, they can even be planted in pots for a while. And I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to lay my garden out. I had some like 20 gallon fabric pots that I planted roses into. Um, that's a great temporary solution. But I will say that now that I have almost all of my roses in the ground versus in pots, they do prefer being in the ground. Um, the key is that roses are gluttons for water and nutrients. So if you have nutrient poor soil, you're going to want to amend that soil on a repeating basis, which is, is harder with perennials. So every year I go through and top dress with compost to add more nutrients to the soil, improve my soil structure, improve the microbiology of the soil as well, which then improves the health of the plant. Um, roses are heavy drinkers. Right now it's very challenging in Baltimore with the lack of rain that we've had to keep up with them. Um, I, my roses have performed best in the summer when we've had about three inches of rain a week, which is really challenging. Um, that's like a torrential thunderstorm at least two days a week. Um, so water, 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 but don't overwater because roses don't like wet feet. So here's, this is where everyone kind of runs into that rose mythology, right? Where it's like roses like a lot of water, but they don't like wet feet. So finding that line with your soil and your situation is going to be important. Um, roses are also notoriously heavy feeders. I fertilize with a solid fertilizer after each bloom cycle. Um, that's something that I just sprinkle around the base of the plant. I currently hand feed, which is kind of a pain. Um, there's other ways to do that. Not everyone, it won't work for everyone. I just have a, such a small growing space that there's no way to um, involve any equipment or mechanical operation. And then I use a diluted liquid fertilizer every two weeks. Um, and then just monitor your potted roses because they will need more nutrients than your in-ground roses just because they'll uptake them a lot quicker. Um, so I use for the liquids, a blend of fish emulsion and um, Maxi or a similar seaweed blend. Um, the Maxi is actually um, something that I got from Grace Rose Farm originally, for anyone that is familiar with that company, um, it's something that she's always recommended and I found performs really, really well for my roses. It comes as almost like a powder, but it's, put, it's fully water soluble. Um, so I dilute it with a little bit of water and then feed with that. Um, there's also other similar 16, 16, 16 seaweed based products you can buy on like Amazon. Um, just check the ingredient list. I think one right now that I've used as a substitute is called like Brosi. Um, but I do think that I have a strong preference for using an organically based fertilizer, like a seaweed based versus like a miracle Grow, um, which is chemical based. That's my personal preference. Um, so if you have a product that you use that has those ratios, that works great. And then my not so secret solid fertilizer recipe is right down here. I actually got this from a famous rosarian in the American Rose Society, Gay Hammond. Um, so this is her recipe. This recipe on the left, the one cup of alfalfa meal, cotton seed, fish meal is per plant. So as you can tell, that's like wow. four cups of fertilizer per plant. Um, since I am trying to spread the fertilizer out to be a little bit more regular to get better bloom cycle for cut flowers between each plant. I feed on a more diluted basis. So I do one cup in the spring and then a cup after each bloom cycle. And then I'll take a little bit of a break after my last day of cuts and then start about with that again, about four weeks um, before I want my next cuts for the fall. Um, the Gay's method that she describes is for ease of application, not necessarily consistent bloom, if that makes sense. So it's a lot easier to apply one round of fertilizer in the spring and be done with it if you're growing roses as just a garden plant um, versus trying to get that consistent repeat flowering for cut flowers. 
and this will be in the recording. Take a screenshot, email me about it. That's completely fine. This recipe is not secret at all. I'm happy to share it with it. It's not mine. It's just one that I know um, and use. The um, kind of maintenance, going back to growing roses and maintenance, um, staying on top of disbudding is important if you want to grow for cut roses. There's no point in letting your rose bloom on a six inch stem because you can't cut that for a florist. So part of my harvesting process is going around and disbudding. If I see a bud formed on the stem that's not a florist length stem, I'll cut it. And by cutting it, I use my fingernails. Um, you're welcome to use your snips, but rosebuds are so small when I try to catch them, that you can just pop them right off of your fingers and it won't damage the plant. Um, your first harvest, you want, or all harvest in general, you wanna keep about half of your plant intact. Um, I've actually heard this rule for peonies as well, and I think it's a good rule for all perennials, um, is about leaving about half your plant when you make your first cuts. So that means, if you've planted a bare root in March, and right now in what, late June, it's the solstice, happy solstice, that plant has doubled in size, take your cuts. Cut your stems for your florists, um, leave half your plant, feed well, water well afterwards, and you can go ahead and start um, recouping the investment for that plant. Not quite the same as peonies where everyone tells you to wait, but. Yes, I'm a big fan of cutting that first year. If your plant has doubled in size, that's a big caveat. Um, and this is just one of my tips for anyone who's new to roses in general. Roses put out red new growth. Um, it can look a lot of different ways. Um, you'll see some darker colors to the left, some brighter colors in the middle, and some um, red shades with green towards the right, it's, it can easily freak you out if you're not used to seeing it. Red is not super normal in the plant world um, and bright red new growth can also be a sign of certain diseases that are endemic to the East Coast for roses. Um, so I just would always say that if you see red new growth on your plant initially, don't freak out. Lauren, can you go back um, yeah. to that recipe slide one more time? Yeah. Somebody asked if that was two recipes or one recipe. So one recipe is down here in the black, and then to the right is my application method. Got it. So Gay's recipe, would the original recipe is all of these um, per together plant, like mix mm -hmm. together, apply all that per plant. Got it. I mix all that together in a big mortar pan and then scoop out a cup per plant and then do the next thing, do the next application in what is like four weeks for the next rebloom cycle. Got it. Um, so I modify it to spread the feed out over a longer period of time. Cool. Yep. Um, I'll jump in here for a, another quick question. Would you can this is a question? Would you consider an older bare root, three to four years old, but has been transplanted this spring? Would you consider that a young plant or a mature plant? So I would consider that a young plant um, simply because it's young to your space. So it doesn't have the root structure to support regrowth yet since it's been transplanted. Um, the plant is more likely to grow faster because it has more energy reserves, but I would still hold that same rule to about um, half the plant. So like, um, for example, I did buy some three to four year old bare roots this spring. Um, a few of them have doubled in size, which is great. I'm cutting from them. Ellen, there's some distant drums coming to you tomorrow from those plants. Um, but there have been one or two that are lagging behind and cutting a stem that is usable for a florist from those plants would mean cutting um, over half the plant off. And I am not comfortable doing that yet. I have to remind myself sometimes and I, I'm sure everyone has this battle that I would rather have that plant produce stems for the next 25 years 
purses cut four stems off of it right now. Um, so it's just a lot of waiting, but I would consider any plant that is new to the place you have put it in kind of starts the clock over again. It's going to catch up faster. It's going to grow a lot faster, but that first um, period after transplanting is really important to let the roots establish. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for monitoring the chat. Yeah. I have not been. I'm just I'm very I'm just talking good. away here. Um, um, pest management can be challenging and a hot topic for everyone. Um, I would say that pest management is very individual based on your gardening philosophy. Um, roses are a pest magnet. They tend to be everyone's favorite snack. Um, so I would say if you have other flower crops, you might want to manage them in a similar way to managing your other crops. Um, there are some unique ones to roses, for example, like cane boring insects. Um, we have a beneficial insect, insect in my reason, region which is a parasi parasitic wasp that eats aphids or parasitizes aphids, um, but it also bores into canes uh, and it loves to bore holes into my roses. So you'll find me in about two weeks with my Elmer's glue, sealing all the cut ends I can find to make sure that I don't have cane borer damage. Um, this is really unique to my micro area. You might not have this insect population and it might not be an issue. So don't worry, don't worry until you see them that you need to see all the cut ends of canes because that is a horrible chore. Um, the other big pest that I think can ruin a crop that a lot of flower farmers have to um, contend with are thrips. Um, they've ruined a few of my blooms this year um, and I've had to break out um, the sprays for them. Unfortunately, I like to follow an integrated pest management practice here. Um, if you are a no spray organic gardener, that is completely fine. Um, but I do think that you have to kind of feel out for yourself what the right solution is, because if you're okay doing a no spray and maybe losing some of your blooms to insect damage, that's fine. If you want to cut and sell as many stems as possible, you might have to spray something. Um, I tend to be a reactive sprayer versus a proactive sprayer, which is probably not common advice. I'd rather know I have an issue than prevent an issue I don't have. Um, yeah. Um, so here's my, my lovely um, integrated pest management chart I stole from the internet. Um, it start, <laughs> starts with... Um, some easy practices at the bottom, which are more physical practices of, of removing bugs. Um, I do have um, a lot of beneficial in insects that I order in. Um, I actually, Heirloom Roses is offering a subscription now for beneficial insects. So I'll get, um, I got a delivery in May, I'll get a delivery in June, and I'll get another delivery in July um, of a variety of beneficials. I think they're going to continue that. Um, and then I have my favorites, my little arsenal of things that I use. Almost um, stars are my favorites. I've also mm -hmm. got earwigs. So Sluggo Plus is great for earwigs and slugs. Um, I use a sulfur-based product for fungal diseases like black spot. Um, and powdery mildew, which is new this year with our drought that we've got going on. And then I tend to prefer uh, a spinosad for thrips. I like to spray at night when the bees are asleep to hopefully not affect the insect population. And I really don't like to spray as much as possible, not only to protect our pollinators, but because I am lazy and it is a big chore. Um, but in order to combat the thrips population that we've had this year, it's just been a necessity or else I wouldn't be selling any flowers. Um, so I don't want to be unrealistic with everyone and say that you can have a beautiful cut rose garden without spraying. If you can, please tell me your secrets. Um, but I've found that once you get into the summer months or any kind of environmental stressors, you might need to consider having um, a backup plan for spraying. I didn't have any thrips until it started getting dry.
All right, moving on to some of the fun steps. That's the basics and the logistics of growing roses. Um, I have a few varieties here that I would say are confidence building varieties. I consider these incredibly easy to grow, easy to cut, and popular colors for florists. So if you're looking to get into growing roses with cut flowers, I would recommend all these varieties. Um, Queen of Sweden is fantastic and Bathsheba as well. They're both David Austin roses. Bathsheba is marketed as a climbing rose, um, which is great because it gives you like some long straight stems for flowers. Um, and then Distant Drums is incredibly popular um, as a color for florists right now. It kind of has those mauve tones that I just, I don't think are ever going away. Um, it has horrible thorns though. So I'm just warning everyone with that. Very thorny. Very thorny. Um, but these right, are wait, hold on, before you keep going, one, but going back to spraying and bugs and critters and things, somebody asked about opossum digging around roses. Any? any I have anything? never experienced that. Um, so we, in the corner of Baltimore that, that I live in, have, I feel like, every critter known to man. Um, I've experienced squirrels, squirrels digging around my roses um deer eating my roses rabbits eat them in the winter um incredibly lucky that we don't have gophers or big bull population because they will literally eat the roots out from under your roses um so if you know that gophers are an issue you might want to consider adding um like a chicken wire gopher basket at planting to help prevent that um but i've never heard of possums doing that huh. all right well We'll have to do a little more research and see how. Yeah, I wonder if there's anything like around the possums, like around the roses that the possums would be interested in. I right. I don't know enough about them besides they're North America's only marsupial. That's my, that's limit of my possum knowledge. All right, good. All right, back to, back to the beauties. Yeah, so these are good. I would consider these confidence building varieties. They're hard. They'll be popular to sell to florists and they're hard to mess up. If for example, um, they have great disease resistance and they don't take a lot of work to shape into a, a plant that has cuttable stems. Um, I have uh, some rules of three I abide by when ordering plants and buying perennial plants. Um, I do three of each variety for three years before I make my final judgment call on if I'm going to keep a plant. Um, the three of each variety is because sometimes plant quality is different. You can get one plant that just does not want to live and the other two do absolutely great. So having that kind of minimum of three will help you actually judge the performance of a, of a variety and not necessarily of a specific plant. Um, and then like all other perennials, I think the adage of sleep, creep and leap applies to roses. They'll grow a lot slower their first two years. And then the third year, you'll feel like you're growing a different plant. They'll explode, they'll be out of control. You'll wonder how this rose is taking over its whole bed. Um, and then I also have my personal rule of three, um, which I call like my three stripes for getting rid of a plant. I was discussing this with Ellen for a variety I'm gonna get rid of um, earlier. Uh, it's got low bloom production, got poor disease resistance, and it's annoying. It's just annoying me. Like it, it's a grafted plant, so that's kind of like half a strike against it. Um, and it's just, it's not performing. I don't have the space for it, so it's gotta go. Or it's gotta find a new home. Yeah. Um, so I encourage everyone to kind of try to ab abide by those threes if you can. I know when you get into growing roses, there are so many amazing varieties. You want to try them all. I still have that issue. Um, but if you can make yourself slow down a little bit and order three of each variety, that'll also provide you with a better cut crop to sell to florists as well. So you have more, more of a particular color. Um, so where do you get your plants from? Um, I get this question a little bit um, and I have a couple of different resources for that. 
So you, the big difference between buying roses for retail and buying roses wholesale is price um, and customer service, to be quite honest. Um, if you're a small farm operation, um, it takes a little bit of persistence to place a wholesale order with one of the big people like Star or Weeks Roses, um, but their price, price is reflectant of um, a wholesale product. Um, there are some outfits that do both wholesale and retail rose plants. Um, I've listed those kind of in the middle, Grace Rose Farm, Heirloom Roses, Northland Rosarium, and David Austin Roses. Um, you'll see up to a 40% discount off of retail at some of these. Most of them are in line with 20%. Sometimes that 20% discount um, plus the cost of freight makes it almost the same as retail. Um, and that's where I would say um, exploring retail options isn't always a bad idea, um, especially if you get plants that are more in the $35 range. It's not a horrible investment for a plant, for a rose plant that's going to last in theory 50 years. Um, and if you plant it in the spring, care for it, you should be able to recoup the cost of that plant with your cuts by the end of the season. That's always my goal and my metric with how much money I spend on my plants is if I do the math and say, you know, a $40 plant, that's 10 stems. I need to sell 10 stems of this rose from this plant over the course of the season to recoup the actual physical cost of the plant itself, not the inputs. If I think that's possible, it's a no brainer. Um, but yeah. Lauren, is that number that you just said 10 stems per plant, is that made up or is that, is that about how many you would get on a plant? Mm -hmm. And does that vary between plants? Varies between plants. Um, I did not put this on any slide, but we're, I'm happy to talk about it. Um, my metric for plants is about one and a half to two stems per plant per week over the course of the growing season. That's how much I expect it to produce. Um, young plants are not gonna quite perform. Do the math with the cost of the plant. So for example, if, a plant, if the plant did cost me $40 and I'm selling my um, roses per stem for $4, I would need to sell then 10, 10 stems from that single plant over the course of the season, mm -hmm. then make up for it. And that's always, that's kind of my metric that I abide by to see if the plant is worth it. You know, for example, spending $70 on a plant and then having to divide that by the cost per stem, it's going to be a young plant. It starts to, the math doesn't start to make sense. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, good. Thank yeah, you. I recommend all these sources. I think they're great. There are other ones out there. I just haven't necessarily ordered from them. Doesn't mean they're good or bad. And now on to harvesting. Um, harvest stage is a hot topic because you absolutely do not harvest garden roses the way that you see commercially available cut roses that are imported into the United States. Um, so you wanna harvest your garden roses in really tight buds. Um, which is critical for the best base life for your forest. Kind of once you see, especially the big fluffy roses, once you see the inner structure of those petals, it's done. It's past its prime. It's going to last like a day in the vase. It's going to shatter. It's going to be a mess. And then um, you as the, as the grower or your florist is going to have to deal with that. Um, so the uh, sepals down, which are like the kind of four leafy prongs that the bud comes in. So um, the green parts around the bud, once those have turned completely down, like you can see here in the um, left photo, that's when you know a rose is ready to harvest. Once those first guard petals, the outer petal, petals have started peeling away from the bud itself, that is the perfect stage. I, have, I think this is, I was just gonna inter, interject that I feel like this is like really important and it's important for florists too 
And I feel like um, that is one of the benefits, clearly, from my perspective of working directly with a local grower, because um, like I said, we had not ever used roses before. So I literally, when I started working with Lauren, knew absolutely nothing about roses, like zero. Um, and Which so really each beneficial year, yeah, exactly. Each year, like working together, um, you know, we have, st our team has started to learn more about how roses work and understand when the proper harvest time is so that, and Lauren is also great too. So just like, if you're a grower, I would say that this is, um, you know, Lauren's a good example of this. She will always say, you know, here's some that are too open that, you know, I'm gifting you to mm -hmm. come with you or to, you know, show off on Saturday or, you know, do with whatever. Um, so really being, being communicative, I think, farmer to florist so that the florist can learn um, what that proper stage is. And also, I think it helps manage the expectations because, I mean, frankly, for me, like getting it in that first, you know, not quite ready to ready stage, I might be thinking, well, is that really going to open? I don't really know. Um, or, you know, I might see the not sellable one and be like, oh, this is perfect and not really understand that it's going to fall apart in a day. Um, so I think that's like one of the clear benefits of working directly with a farmer who can sort of share that sort of information with the florist. Right, right. And being um, able to have that sort of two-way communication is really important too. Um, I got a question from a florist recently who was new to Garden Roses and, and a new customer to me. Um, he picked up for me and messaged me the next day and was like, hey, these are all kind of drooping. I freaked out. I was like, please send me a picture, like immediately, just thinking that I had done something wrong. Um, she sent me a picture and I was like, oh, like th these are normal. They're just, they don't have the like really straight upright heads that wholesale roses do. Like they do kind of bend a little bit. Um, but they look well hydrated. They're going to hold up. It's just not going to be a straight up and down, you know, ramrod straight product. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then, um, like Ellen said too, I, if I have roses that are blown open or have like blown open in the cooler, I will typically put them in with bunches for my florists. Just that way, kind of, they know what the buds will turn into. And that if they have retail customers, they can advertise that to their retail customers. Yeah. My harvest process is pretty simple. Um, I harvest directly into water with all the leaves still on. That bucket then comes to a table with me once it's full. I strip the leaves, but leave the thorns um, and then place into a hydration solution and place into a cooler. Um, the reason for stripping the leaves is because they can decompose in water and create bacteria. The reason for leaving the thorns is that every thorny pop off your rose stem creates a wound and every wound you have creates the additional opportunity for bacteria to enter the stem and reduce base life. Um, so when I deliver to my florist, they all have thorns on them. Um, this is, it's just part of, again, that like two-way communication and that education when you're working with the florist to say, hey, this one is particularly sharp. Um, mm -hmm. And this is the reason why I leave the thorns on because I would rather not take that risk in the supply chain between me and Ellen um, and then have Ellen potentially address that with her customers then if the thorns need to do come off. Yeah, so we will keep them on until we are ready to ready to go. Somebody, Lauren, somebody's asking what temperature is your cooler. I can certainly say that ours is about forty-two, so not that cold. Mm -hmm. um, um, mine's at thirty-six. Oh, good. You'll see. Perfect. Yes, you guys will see pictures of my cooler because I grow in my Baltimore City backyard, so I don't have like a walk-in cooler. I have um, a upright freezer that was converted into a refrigerator that holds a pretty consistent 36. Um, and that's what I use as my floor cooler. Excellent. Um, and then you'll see too, um, the hydration solution is, is also really important for cut roses. Um, I use Crisol Rose Pro. There's other, like you can use any kind of woody hydration solution. There's a few out there. Um, 
I don't know why I can't think of the other brand name for flower food right now, um, but they make like another woody stem hydration solution. Um, that's really important to extending the base life for as long as possible because garden roses do not have a long base life. Um, and you'll see in the picture on the right too, some of the really open blooms that I packed into a bunch for um, delivery of local color flowers that I would then just make sure that it was clear to Ellen that I'm not charging her for those. Um, that way there's yeah. no, there's no um, miscommunication between us about what is a good bloom and what is it. Yeah. Lauren, somebody asked, once you take the leaves off, but you're keeping the thorns on, how, what, what's the turnaround town? Like how long can they be kept in the cooler? How fast do you try to move them? How fast does a florist try to move them? I can sort of say on our side, but how long can they keep? So not very long. Um, the, the earliest I will harvest for a Thursday pickup or delivery is like is Monday and that's kind of pushing it. Um, so I try to do Monday for Thursday, Monday morning through Thursday morning for anyone who's picking up or I'm delivering to on Thursday morning. And then it would be like Tuesday through Friday morning um, for Friday events. Mm -hmm. um, they'll, they will hold better in the cooler if you keep them in that closer bud. So for example, like even the picture in the middle where it's a little bit more open, I would consider that still sellable but that's not going to hold as well in the cooler because that flower is going to want to continue to open. Yeah. It's important to get them at that tight bud stage. Um, I don't harvest at all over the weekend for the following week because the product just isn't going to last. Mm -hmm. All right, good. Um, yeah, and then um, cold storage is kind of non-negotiable. I um, when I first started out, the roses went into my refrigerator in my house and that was the only cold storage I had. We once tried, we tried a mini fridge once and it completely froze a whole week's worth of flowers. So never again. Um, I know that this is like horrible practice to put your flowers in your refrigerator. Um, which is why we then ended up with the, um, our <laughs> <laughs> makeshift floral cooler. But I feel like everybody has started that way, right? Like everybody has done the horribleness of using their home refrigerator. Right. I mean, yeah. you don't need cold storage and you yeah. do not have the resources or the space available to buy a floor cooler or build a walk-in cooler, you use what you got. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I have the, the new floral cooler has been great been a lot easier to get groceries for a week when I'm there my <laughs> filled um with flowers but this product and I'm happy if anyone's curious about it um I can let everyone know what the model is it's been really great I know sometimes people get nervous about like refrigerators having cold spots it's been really consistent um and it hasn't malfunctioned yet so I've been happy with it um and I put a little note here for my flowers and my cooler that these pink ones were too open and I didn't charge the florist for them. Um, I sent them to her with her order because it was one that she wanted. Um, but I was so nervous about the quality. I was like, I filled your order with a different variety. Take these for free. If they work, great. If they don't work, I won't feel bad. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, just say like one, I, I so much appreciate that because, um, you know, I think when you have a product like roses that you are trying to move quickly and they're expensive you know it is I think a lot of people's first feeling of like I really have to just sell these even though I feel like maybe they're a little past where yeah. they are um if you can avoid doing that um I think your florist will really appreciate that and I think sharing them open so that the florist can keep them learn from them you know, get to know them, show them to customers what they look like when they're open. I think that's really helpful. Right. And somebody asked about quick dip, if you're using any quick dip. Um, I haven't used quick dip in a couple of years. Um, I find that the Rose Pro hydration solution 
um, works just as well. I haven't ever had to um, quick dip any of mine. So I do like the harvest directly into water process and then put it in the hydration solution and put it in the cooler. Excellent. Um, and then this is just my other little tip that took Ellen and I four years to figure out together. Um, oh my God. We were laughing so hard yesterday. We were like, why did we try every ridiculous way of keeping these yeah. roses organized instead of just doing it the way everybody does every flower yeah. ever? Um, so paper. <laughs> part, um, don't even bother with rubber bands when you're leaving thorns on your roses like yeah. that it's just gonna be awful for everyone involved use a um a paper board or bouquet wrap it keeps everything kind of upright it helps organize by color um and it also helps protect some of the bloom heads from any kind of jostling um and I think Ellen you said too it's easier to keep them from like sliding around in the bucket or losing them in the cooler yeah we have we have started to even when we take a stem out or use a couple we'll just wrap the other ones back up in that paper so that right because I mean we'll get into this a little bit more going forward but you know like these roses the stems are not it's not like a long stem rose that has like a very strong long stem these are you know stems that are like bendable and pliable and sinkable and so if they're just sort of low in the bucket they will fall down and then you know you'll find them underwater underneath the rest of the stems. So um, so really keeping them wrapped for us this year has been like a game changer. We just, like Lauren said, we tried lots of different ways and this obviously works the best. Yep, just took us a little bit to get there. This took us a while. Um, Lauren, you can answer this too and I can say what I think, but average stem length that the florists are looking for. 12 to 14 inches. Um, that's kind of my rule of thumb. If someone is dead set on a particular color, I will sometimes say they're going to be a little short this week. Is that okay? And if it's okay, that's fine. And if not, then I can't yeah. really do anything about it. Um, yeah, but I, I would say for us, like as long as we understand what the length is before we are purchasing, then we can make the decision of whether or not that works for us. Right. So like if you are sending an availability list or if you're just selling roses, let the florist know what that length is so that they can make the decision. They might be just making boutonnieres out of them. And if they're, you know, teeny tiny little things, no big deal. If they're making bridal bouquets or something bigger, then, you know, something tiny is not going to work. So just be communicative, let the florist know what that is so that they can make the good decision for themselves. Um, and then somebody, Lauren, also asked if if you're doing sprays or single flowers. Both. Um, it just depends on the variety and how they're blooming. Um, and some varieties will bloom in sprays and some will bloom in single stems. And I price them and sell them the same way. Um, do you have any, do you think that there's, um, do florists have a strong opinion about sprays or singles or they don't care because they're looking for color and that's it? Has ever given me any feedback on that? Um, I mean, coming from my perspective, when I hand someone a spray of roses, I'm like, you're getting five for one. <laughs> um, that has to be good. Right. But I know that that yeah. doesn't always work with how florists design. Sure. Um, but no, I would say, I right. Like we that. do, we are right. Like single stems for almost everything is easier for us to design with. I mean, right. that goes for like you know, I know growers, when they see us like take apart a lysianthus, like down to a single stem, they're like, oh my God, I was so proud of this lysianthus. It's got 20 blooms on it and you just took it apart. Um, if we're doing something like a, you know, market bouquet or a wrapped bouquet for sales, you know, that's an easier way to use mm -hmm. um, sprays. Um, if we're using it in a bridal bouquet, we're usually cutting off those side buds, but then we'll keep them and use them in boutonnieres or in head crowns or in something else. 
So it just sort of depends on the thing that we are using them for. Right. Yeah. Somebody asked too about um, price per stem. I know we talked about this yesterday. Yeah, um, I think I have that in a in a new in a, the next slide. Ah, oh, all right. Yeah, it's so we're gonna people. get the price 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 in a second. Um, yeah, I think that covers it for post harvest care timing of um, harvest versus sale. Like, there's they're not your two week roses. Yeah, and that's fine. Um, yeah which is actually how um, I have begun kind of marketing them to florist customers is that these are not commodity roses, but they are complementary to commodity roses in your designs. Cause a lot of florists are not like Ellen and local color flowers. They don't solely source locally. So they will be using imported roses in their designs. Um, and my niche, as I start working with someone new is this is not going to necessarily replace those commodity roses, but it can complement your designs. It can make them more elegant and it can add a little bit of fragrance um, to your bouquets and to your arrangements that will then have an impact um, on your customers. Yeah. And then um, right now too, at least in the region that I'm in, in Maryland, um, is a little bit of, a lull with focal flowers. We're past peonies and we're pre dahlias and sunflowers. So right now is where the roses get to shine. Like they're the focal flower out there. I actually think sunflowers just started. So I, I lied a little bit, um, but they're, they have a few weeks after peonies but before other big blooms start where they're the focal flower. And for anyone looking to source locally, like that is a, a great way to kind of market your product at that time. Yeah, I know we're, I'm, I have this on a future slide, but I'll just jump in here and say that for us, um, roses in the spring, you know, Lauren and I have worked on this like for a few years now is because sometimes they come on during peony season mm -hmm. and, you know, peonies, you know, I'm, I mean, there's just no, you know, peonies are the Queens. They just like take over everything. They, you know, everybody wants them. They're gigantic. You just can't compete with them. Mm -hmm. And so selling peonies and roses at the exact same time could sometimes be difficult. So we have been trying to time sort of the, the peak rose production so that they're coming at the tail end of peonies and really before dahlias. So Lauren's right for us, especially, this is a very difficult time for us between peonies and dahlias because, right, there are not a lot of focal flowers. And we have also been pushing our growers to have sunflowers available now and sometimes even lilies because they at least are filling a hole for us for focals. But for, but those are more for like uh, wrapped bouquets or single orders. That's not as much for like a bridal bouquet where, um, where roses are really taking that focal flower position, you know, end of May, mid May to the end of May to 4th of July. Um, huge way to offer. I mean, huge opportunity, I think, to market to florists mm -hmm. in that way. Right. Um, if you are lucky too, you can get your roses to bloom before peonies. So it's a little bit of work. I think I was right on the front end of peonies and then got a little bit of a lull and then hit the tail end of peonies this year, which was just good timing. Yeah. First year I hit Mother's Day. Yeah. I mean, Mother's Day, I mean, depending on where you are, for us, hitting Mother's Day with basically roses or peonies is like, you know, yeah. hitting, hitting the jackpot. I mean, it's just, yeah. Um. I skip the slide? Nope, didn't skip the slide. <laughs> I forgot what order I put these in. Um, so I do tend to market the roses more as event flowers than retail flowers um, with their shorter vase life, um, their unique shape and their fragrance. They just make event work a no-brainer for me. Um, there's a lot of education that comes in to edit, um, with your end consumer if you're selling them as a retail product. Um, for maybe a one-time customer to be like, this is different than your grocery store roses. It's not going to last 14 days in the vase. It might last five. 
Um, and sometimes that can be challenging um, and potentially not worth it for that retail customer. Event work, on the other hand, you only have to make it really two days, a couple hours, look good in photos. Right. Um, and then all is forgiven for your flowers. That's, That's right. not saying that people don't buy them retail. And I think Ellen has a unique business model that way. Um, but I do tend to work more with event florists than retail florists. Yeah, I think this is a this is a very specific product. And Lauren and I talk a lot about, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but about educating, um, not just educating the florists, but educating the end users about why this product is really not a commodity rose and why it is very different. And to sort of manage the expectations of the end user, especially if you're selling retail, um, because you never, I never, as the floor is selling to an end user, I never want to sell them something that they expect to last 14 days and I give it to them and it lasts three days, especially a product like a rose, like this specific rose that, you know, I'm charging a premium for because it is a premium product. So we want to really manage the expectations um, for any retail customer, um, but certainly using them for events, um, you know, is a little bit easier. And there was a question of, of whether or not we're using them mostly for weddings. And I would say, absolutely. We are using them mostly for events. We do sell them directly to customers, but a lot of those customers are people that we have really basically groomed to love this product. Um, these are people, Lauren knows these people. These are people who have come to classes with us, who have follow us on social media, who come in and buy these roses and just love them like, like we do. So, you know, it's a, it's a niche group of people within a niche group of people who are buying these as retail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you got a compliment in the chat on the bouquet. Oh, thanks. Um, that was that was last year sometime. Uh, yeah, cute. Those roses. See what I mean? Like this time of year, it's hard for us because you can see, like, other than the rose, there's not really a focal. There's other stuff that's all great. And you know, in our head, sometimes we're like, can scoop scabiosa be a focal flower? I don't know. Like right now they're gigantic. So yeah, maybe, but yeah. no, I mean, realistically, no. So roses do play like a great role this time of year for, um, for focals. Ah, in the wrong one. So um, part of marketing the florist is also finding the right florist for you, finding the right fit. Selling in small quantities is hard, especially when you're used, to, your florists are used to being able to order whatever they want, whatever week they want, and having an endlessly available supplies of commodity roses. Um, I have kind of gotten around that by selling by color or by palette versus individual variety. So for example, this is actually a sample of my availability list. I do grower's choice every week where you can just um, make a note or email me your palette um, and I will match it the best I can. I usually send pictures beforehand just because I'm petrified of letting someone down or surprising someone. So I'll always send pictures um, to make sure the colors are okay. And then I group other varieties by color. So like blush pink, whites and creams, um, that actually really helps with, you know, maybe I don't have Desdemona blooming this week, but I do have quietness and it's a little bit different of a shape. It's a little bit different of a color, but it's still a blush pink. Um, and then. Yeah. And for us, this, this method has worked terrifically. Like um, we are not expecting to buy a hundred of the same flower. Um, we're also not expecting to use a hundred of the same roses in our centerpieces. I know that most florists do use commodity roses in that way. We are not. And because we aren't, um, shopping by color is much more manageable to us than having to, um, understand and learn 
quickly. I'm not saying I don't want to learn. We are learning, but it is a slow process of yeah. learning all of the varieties. So, because we just have not had any experience of this. Um, so being able to say 10 blush and, you know, 10 blush is going to be great. That's all we need. We don't need a sp specific variety. Um, we are not, you know, promising any specific variety to a customer in the way maybe a traditional florist may have. Um, I would say if you're a florist following along tonight, you know, as much as you can, especially with roses, but just in general, you know, shop, shopping to customers by color, by shape, by texture, by interest is going to be much, you know, just a much better solution than trying to sell specific flowers to people um, for wedding bouquets. I'm biased, I know, but... Um, <laughs> Are, I'm hard. I'm hard in fact on them. That's a that. There's just yeah. Yeah, it's easier. It's easier for me to just um and like I put a note under the photo on the right that the palette notes were like summery, peachy, golden pinks, and I sent this photo to the floor to the florist and said, "I is this good?" She said, "Yep, it's perfect." And I said, "Great, thank you for trusting me." <laughs> yeah. And then I know we did have a question earlier about pricing. These are my prices. Um, so I sell per stem and you can buy whatever quantity you want. You can buy five stems and you can be, buy 50 stems or 80 stems or hundred stems. Um, the price per stem is based on my inputs, plant material, fertilizers, water, time, um, as well as in line with buying this product from other growers and having it shipped. So for example, you might be able to find distant drums for sale from a California rose farm for $3 or $3.50 a stem. And then you're paying $80, $90 in overnight shipping to get that product to you. Um, so my price per stem is a little bit higher than some other growers that do solely garden roses but I don't ship. So you're paying for the product, not paying for the packaging. Yeah. One thing I was going to say about the pricing for us or for any florist, you know, a standard uh, for, for florists, standard markup is a three times markup on, on single stems. So, you know, in terms of like what the market says I should be charging, you know, it would be a three times markup on $4. So that's like what, 12 bucks I should be charging for each of these stems. You know, frankly, in Baltimore City, uh, uh, I don't have the clientele. People have the clientele out there, but we don't. Mm -hmm. um, we do not have people that are going to pay $12 for, uh, for a rose. Um, one, because I don't have the right people. And two, um, $12 is a lot for a stem of flowers. Yep. Um, especially something that is not going to last more than a couple of days. However, that is why using them for events is really for us um, such a good choice because with event work, we have much more flexibility in our budget. Um, just the way, you know, we work, we can, you know, use a $4 stem in a bridal bouquet, no problem. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for you to absorb the price of that than trying to sell them retail. So don't be afraid to charge what they're worth. Yeah, for sure. Do not for sure. I mean, don't buy them if you can't, if you can't sell them and make a profit. Um, I would also say just don't look at a wholesaler's website. True. And look at their prices because it'll just make you sad. Um, <laughs> um, they're different. Um, don't do that to yourselves. It's different. Yeah. Um, these are just some some of the great varieties I'm growing. One of my friends, Katie, took these pictures, so I have to always show them off. Yeah, they're stunning. Yeah, but now it's it's your show, Ellen. Somebody's wait, I want to jump in. Somebody's asking, would you charge a higher price per stem for those stems like J'adore or Amnesia or O'Hara's? I don't even know what those are. So you're going to have to like. Yeah. So um, I'm getting a few of those in the fall, I 
Ooh, in the fancy in the fancy new ones yes the fancy new ones um and I will charge the same price um so it is just a lot easier for me to keep my pricing simple and have it four dollars a sum no matter what um and be able to um advertise my roses like that I will say that buying amnesia for example from the wholesaler is not is going to be much cheaper than four dollars to sim it's probably going to be like 250 so that's where it's going to be um potentially the challenge in getting florists to spend the extra money for the same product but sourcing it locally yeah um, which is also why i'm keeping the prices like consistent um, from a business perspective i would say too, if, you're, if you're selling in small quantities um you know, having different prices for different stems is going to make it more, frankly, more challenging for the florist to buy in that way. Because if you have, you know, 30 different varieties and you have two stems of this and five stems of this and three stems of this and everything is priced differently, for, for a florist, you're going to be like, well, do I really have the time to like go through each of these varieties, each of these stems, each of these prices? Um, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's not going to be worth it. So having, you know, a flat rate for us has made buying much easier that and buying by color, because I can say 20 light pink, whatever. I don't have to worry that one is $4 and one is $5 and one is $3. Right. Just say blush. It's easier to do substitutions that way too. Yeah. Um, that way you're not um, asking someone if you can like upcharge them. But yeah, I the those plants specifically that are mentioned they're a little bit they're more expensive so um I did make the decision just this year that I was going to keep my prices the same charge the same and then just hope that they do really well and if they don't do really well um you guys will see me advertising them for sale <laughs> all right on that note yep. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's see, Lauren, you're going to click my slides for me. Yes. Um, all right, so I want to just go over a few things from our, from the florist side. Um, and you guys, Lauren can feel free to jump in and feel free to ask questions. Um, things that are important to us when we are, um, when the roses arrive. And this is basically based on uh, past mistakes that we have made. Um, one is it like we need a plan to how we're going to use them. So a lot of times we will say, oh, give us, you know, 30 stems and we'll figure it out. Um, we really need to have a plan internally. So um, because the vase life is short, we need to be ready to move them. So oftentimes, because our retail sales are only on Saturday, um, if Lauren is going to deliver them on Friday, we're ready to sell them to customers on Saturday. And in many cases, we try to pre-sell them. So we will text a list of VIP customers who we know like roses, and we will say, we have these. If you want them, we'll set them aside for you. Um, what we don't want, because the price is high for us, is to be left with a bunch of stuff at the end of a weekend that we know is not going to last. Uh, we have in the past dried roses. We do dry roses if we have stuff left over. They do dry great, um, but we that's not that's not the goal. So we really want to have a plan, move them quickly, um, keep them cool so that you know they come in, they go right in the cooler. And again, what we talked about is keeping them wrapped in paper or in a like a skinny vase so that they don't get lost in a bucket. Like I said, sometimes these stems are just like on the shorter side and keeping them in like a full black bucket of, um, you know, like a regular florist bucket sometimes doesn't work. So keeping them wrapped is always, I think, a good idea for us. So I was looking back through old photos too. Um, and I have delivered many um, a rose delivery to Ellen in an old olive jar. Yes, you know, like olive jars. Olive jar or um, a milk carton with the top cut off because I just didn't have the quantity to deliver in a bucket. They would have all flopped over. The heads would have broken. We would have both been sad. So. And 100% better to show up with an olive jar 
because you know that that is going to protect the flowers than to put five stems in a black bucket where you know that those stems are not strong enough and not big enough to support being in that kind of bucket. Right. Um, okay, so great. So that's what we do when they come in. Um, we already talked about timing. Um, you know, for us, these are available um, sort of May to 4th of July, then Lauren takes a break. Everybody, the roses take a break, as she always tells us, and she takes a break. Um, and then they come back around Labor Day and they go through frost. Um, summer's off is great for us because honestly, there are not as many events in the summer in this part of our, our world because it's much too hot. Um, and like I said already, they're like the perfect focal flower between pe peonies and dahlias in the spring for us. Um, all right. Um, this was like great. Lauren said this yesterday, and I really, I want to just like harp on it for a minute. Um, local roses don't fit the recipe mentality. You know, a lot of traditional florists are using, most florists probably, use recipes in their designs. So, you know, weeks or maybe months in advance, a florist will put together a recipe for a bridal bouquet, bridesmaid, centerpieces, church arrangements, you know, all of these things are made with recipes. Um, local roses really do not fit into that. And if you're a farmer, um, you shouldn't be marketing that way either, because there just will never be enough stems I don't think. I mean, maybe in some different world there will be. Um, maybe in the future. In the future. Yes, in the future. Just today, um, you are not going to be able to sell, you know, 500 of the exact same flower that will fit in a recipe for a 50 centerpiece wedding. Um, you really should be for the farmer, you know, selling these as what I would call, you know, like an accent. Um, a way for people to elevate their designs um, with this special touch. And that is really how we're using them. If you can see in these designs, um, and then in the next in the next slide, you know, we're really using them as an accent piece. So there's other flowers that we're using as well, but these are um, these are added, really to make the design very special. So, you know, I always say for bridal bouquets, this is the most special thing you're going to be making for this wedding. Even if you're making a million things, what that bride is carrying is the most special. And so we will oftentimes save all of the roses for her um, or, you know, her and her bridesmaids. Mm -hmm. um, and I would just say like another note about sort of, um, designing with garden roses. These, like I said, these are not roses that have very long, very strong stems. And so a florist who is used to getting commodity flowers, like Lauren was mentioning a florist before, they may just not know how to use them um, because the stems are so pliable, so short. Um, you are probably not like for us, just like detail wise, we're probably not like using them in a hand tied bouquet the way you would lysianthus or peonies. The stems are just not strong enough. So we're really like tucking, tucking them in at the end. Everything is, all these roses are basically being tucked into designs to add like the icing on the cake for those designs. Um, personal flowers are the main place that we use them. So bridal bouquets um, and boutonnieres, head crowns, corsages, um, if we're putting them in centerpieces, it's usually for like the head table or for um, the sweetheart table somewhere where they really are going to shine. We generally are not putting them in every centerpiece in every in every arrangement. Right. Um, but that's OK. That's not like for us, like I always think like it is the most special flower for the most special designs. Um, and that I think is a, is a great way to market it to a florist. Um, cause that's how I think they should be used. Yeah. So I did um, see one question in the chat about varieties and we can have oh, yeah. that at the end. Uh -huh. Um, all right. So I guess maybe just one of the last things I want to say before we take some questions is, um, just the importance of education 
farmer to florist education, and then florist to end user education. And I would say if you're a florist, you really want to learn as much as you can about the difference between local roses, garden roses, and commodity roses. It's really our job as floral professionals who are selling to end users to become expert in all of the flowers that we're selling. Um, it is our job to educate the customers about what those flowers are like. And for us, that means who's growing them, what the farm's like, how they grow, how they're harvested, where they come from, when they're available. Um, the more you can, the more you know, the more you can share with your customers. And I always encourage you to leverage your grower's knowledge. So Lauren, without her, we would literally know zero. Um, she has, she meets with us, you know, twice a year in a formal meeting. I'm not talking about like the education that she gives us when she just mm -hmm. shows up for deliveries. That's also great. But, you know, she takes time to sit down with our whole team and explain to us not only like, literally like this presentation, probably every year um, mm -hmm. so that we remember how they're grown, how they're harvested, um, these new varieties. And then she keeps us up on like what's new in the world of roses. And what that does is it allows me as the florist to share that with my customers to get them excited, not only about the product, but about Lauren and her farm and her story. Um, and when I have that information, it also, again, helps me manage the customer's expectations because I want to be really transparent with them about what this product is and what it does. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want them, like Lauren said, I'm paranoid too about like disappointing someone or mm -hmm. giving them a product that they think is something that it's not. Um, so as a florist, that is all part of our job with any new flower, with any new product. Um, but, you know, we really want to make sure that we're sharing that. And you can use, of course, you know, use social media to share that. You can, you know, do all of the things. Um, one of the things I think that for us, for end users, not for bridal customers or wedding customers, but really for end users that come in and, and just buy retail, showing the flowers off um, in real life has really been, um, it's been really fun. Um, we just started doing it. I don't, this year, I don't know why we didn't really do this before, but so every Saturday when our shop is open, we have just started taking a couple stems and putting them in like a little flower frog pin cup, um, right at checkout with a sign that says like, smell the roses or smell these local roses, something like that. Um, and it is, uh, very, I mean, it's fun, but it's also very rewarding to see people's faces and to see their reactions when they do smell them, because, you know, the fact that these roses are fragrant is a very defining characteristic of them. It's very different than commodity roses. Most commodity roses have had scent bred out of them. Um, they are not the thing that we have, you know, we have a lot of scent memory about roses, right? Mm -hmm. So commodity roses do not bring us to that scent memory where these roses really do and letting people smell them and then having the conversation opened in that way to then be able to say, oh, these are different. These are not, you know, grocery store roses. Let me tell you about them. Let me tell you about the grower. Let me tell you that they're grown in Baltimore city. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot available to share with them. And that is the kind of information, frankly, that gets people coming back that's what gets people texting me Thursday night, asking if the roses are coming. Um, so the more that you can be an educator for your customers, I think the more um, your customers will sort of repay you in interest and, um, and certainly in sales. All right, that's all, that's all we got for you. Yeah. That's we told you all of our all of our rose basics for tonight. Um, we can talk about roses for forever. <laughs> we can. Yes, there's a lot. There's there's a million more things to say. Um, World's but you can always reach out to us and ask us questions. Um, or on the last slide, I'll just show you you know our contact information. 
we are going to send a link out to this recording on Wednesday in the newsletter. I want to just prepare you because we have a bunch of stuff going on before then. So the recording will go out on Wednesday yep. um, and we'll send a copy of the slides so you can have those. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions um, that you have if you want to type them in the chat. Yeah. Lauren, somebody asked, did you see, somebody asked mm -hmm. how many different varieties and how many colors of roses? I have no idea at this point. I'm not yeah. going to lie. <laughs> um, so the color families I separate by are like whites and creams, um, blush pink, deep pink. Yellows are all grouped together, which is kind of unfortunate because I have like a pale lemon yellow and like a deep golden yellow. They're not the same. I'm trying to build up my um, stock so I can separate those. Um, we do apricots and peaches. Um, and then I do sell individually the kind of floor, like um, wedding popular varieties like Coco Local or Distant Drums. Those are on a case by case basis. Um, I And there's know. not even like a color. What do you even say is that color? Mauve. Oh, God. Um, like beige. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's color is cocoa. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, so the, the general rule of thumb I have though is like one and a half um, to two stems per plant per week during the growing season mm -hmm. um, to get how much I have available. Um, it's, it's I wish so that if you want to be able to have a consistent supply of say 20 blush pink stems per week you'd want to do the math on how many plants you need for, for that. Um, some are better producers than others, but one and a half to two is pretty, pretty good for our region. Mm -hmm. um, Somebody I, asked about an issue with David Austin. Yeah, so David Austin doesn't really like to sell to um, cut flower growers. They prefer to sell to nurseries. Um, you can buy wholesale from David Austin, but the price is the same as buying retail. So I would say just buy retail and don't deal with their customer service for wholesale. Um, but they do offer a wholesale program. Um, right. There, I would say that David Austin has had some quality issues in the last few years. They're my first ever roses. I love them. They were amazing. Um, I think the pandemic was challenging for them when everyone started buying plants and getting into gardening. The demand exploded. Um, as well as some just weather climate change issues in Texas. Um, but I buy more David Austin's every year and every year I say I'm not going to. So I keep going, they're beautiful flowers. Um, old garden roses, I don't have any old garden roses and I haven't sold them. Um, not saying they wouldn't make good cut flowers. I actually have one that I guess you can consider an old garden rose, it's Ash Wednesday. Um, that's just a personal plant, not a not a cutting plant. I think I bring snippets to Ellen every spring because it's a once bloomer and it's like gray. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's gray rose. It is really pretty. Yeah. Yeah, it is really pretty. Um, info on ideal soil chemistry. Um, roses like slightly acidic soil, not as acidic as like hydrangeas or blueberries, um, but they like a uh, more acidic pH on the more acidic side of neutral, like a six. I think um, NPK, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but they do, they just, they're feeders. They want lots of nutrients available to them. And then top 10 varieties. So the first, the three I had on there, Queen of Sweden, Bathsheba, Distant Drums. Desdemona is my best producer. She's got a short base life though. Um, Munstead Wood is my favorite red and it has the most ridiculous thorns out of any rose. <laughs> it's the one that you look at and you're like, I, I need my gauntlet gloves. I'm touching that. <laughs> yeah. Um, if you need a rose to kind of help build your confidence, Earth Angel is fantastic. It grows like a weed in our area. Um, the blooms are really susceptible to throat pressure though. Um, Princess Alexandra of Kent is amazing. Vanessa Bell. I'm counting my fingers so I can get to 10. Wait, what's the one I have? Which one? That little orange one. 
Oh, Lady of Shalott. That yeah. one's pretty good. Um, that's a good confidence builder too. It doesn't have the longest base life, um, but it is like a, another good um, rose. If you want to just kind of get your rose legs under you, you cannot damage that rose. That's why Lauren gave it to me. Yeah. I cannot grow anything. And I now grow one rose. Yes. Um, and then uh, I think Litchfield Angel is like my favorite white. Again, just anything light colored. I put some light colored ones in there. Um, you're going to have any bloom damage from pests or environmental pressures will show up, that, up there. Um, so that's why they weren't in my confidence builders one because they're, they can be really disheartening if you have heavy bug pressure. Yeah. All right. Anyone else have any last questions before we sign off tonight? Lauren and I both have to see each other early in the morning tomorrow. <laughs> Forgot about that already, but yes, I will be delivering the <laughs> to Ellen tomorrow morning. Um, all right, everyone, we appreciate you being here. Um, we are going to try to continue to do these um, webinars in the fall um, with some other growers uh, in our region about some other flowers, and maybe even some other topics. If you have any that you want to. Um, reach out and ask me to do a little talk about. We're happy to do that. Um, and yep, everyone can, if you have questions, feel free to message me on Instagram too. I usually try to respond the best I can. Yeah, Lauren is very good with sharing information. So definitely use her information. All right, everyone have a great night and happy growing roses. I hope if you are on the fence, you're you're on board at least to try it. Um, uh, oh, somebody asked Lauren's farm name. It's floor by eight. Yes. Floor by eight. It's a play on four by eight, which was the original size of my first flower garden. Four by eight. Four by eight. And very, very you too. <laughs> All right, everyone have a great night and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Night, everyone.